you can tell a good Bible teacher or preacher uh, by ser- various things. One of them is, uh, they, when it comes to biblical truth, they will not waffle. They will not acquiesce to said culture. Um, they will defend the gospel at all cost, at the perversions of the gospel. Uh, Paul was such a man. Uh, Paul loved the Lord, loved the scriptures, would defend them at all cost, uh, and would mince no words about truth because he knew what it was in the balance. Uh, eternal life was in the balance. And so when he writes the church in Galatia uh, in 49 AD, uh, he begins with these very pointed words uh, in verse 6 after he gives his uh, introductions. He says in verse 6, uh, I'm amazed, or in our vernacular, I'm shocked that you uh, in these churches, this would be a the Galatian churches of Iconium, Lystra, Derby, etc. It says, I, I'm, I'm shocked that you're so quickly removed uh, from him who called you by the grace of Christ. For a what? For a different gospel. He says, which is really not another gospel, but only there are some who are disturbing you who distort the gospel of Christ. So there were false teachers in the church. He says, but even if we, he sets up a scenario, but even if we as the apostles or an angel from heaven, you could apply the word materialized, uh, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be tolerated. No, no. Paul says he's, in Greek, anathema. He's accursed to God. As we have said before, so I say now again, he's going to say it again in case you didn't hear what he just said, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is anathema. He's accursed of God. He doesn't know God. Got false gospels in our world? Absolutely. Jesus said that would happen when he left, that the devil would sow tares among the wheat, false gospels. And Paul says, uh, I'm, I'm shocked in 49 AD when I look at your church that you are abandoning the gospel, that you're saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves. You're abandoning that gospel because people have infiltrated your church who are teaching you that you have to obey the Mosaic law and believe in Jesus to be saved. Those are called Judaizers. They were Jewish Christians who said to be saved, to be truly saved, you have to believe in Jesus and obey the Torah. And Paul says, that is another gospel. That is not from God. How would people in our culture take Paul's pointed, pugnacious kind of introduction? Uh, They'd call him all kinds of names, wouldn't they? What would they call him today? He's intolerant. He's hateful. He's what? He's prejudiced. He's what? narrow-minded. I mean, the list is endless, is it not? But Paul says, I don't care what names you're going to call me. This is truth. This is error. Our world has many false gospels which teach obedience plus faith in God of whoever he or she may be. Um, what is the Quran about? Well, it's, it's a rejection of the Holy Trinity, and it believes you must worship God as they disclose him to be and perpetually perform ritualistic works to be saved. What did Paul say? That is not the gospel. That's a gospel of works. Uh, When I was taking a doctoral class last year when I was working on my doctorate in apologetics, I took a class uh, on Mormon theology, which I'd studied most of my life because most of my friends growing up were Mormons. And when I took four years of German, uh, the bishop was my German four teacher. So uh, I knew them quite well. Uh, And Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, what does it teach? I read it. Uh, It teaches uh, belief in God or gods and that you can become God. But in order to be saved, you must perform. You must perpetually perform. Uh, family members in, on my mom's side of the family that are Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, their book, uh, The New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures, should be titled The Mistranslation of the Holy Scriptures because I took six years of Greek, and I can tell you what they did to distort the, the Bible. But same thing. You've got to believe in God. And they also, like, like the Muslims, reject the Holy Trinity. Uh, strict monotheist is what they are. Uh, and you must obey what they say as a church to be saved constantly. Uh, if you want to skip over to uh, science and health, uh, science and health with key to the scriptures, which is really not a key to the scriptures, uh, but if you want to get into the Christian science thinking, uh, same thing, except they 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 go so far as to deny the ontological existence of sin. That's convenient. Uh, and so again, if you want to be saved, you must follow the teachings of Mary Baker Eddy, and hopefully one day you'll arrive at a place like like she arrived at. Um, Paul says, if you deviate from the gospel that I gave you, that you're saved by grace through faith, not by works, you are what? It's anathema to God. It's false teaching, false teaching. No matter how nice the people are, how much they smile and care for each other, it does not lead to life everlasting. This is why Paul minced no words to the Galatians. But that was 49 AD. Add eight years to it. 49 AD plus eight, 57 AD. Who's he writing to then? The Roman church. 
They got Jews in their church too who love the Torah, who say they love Jesus. And Paul says, uh, I've, I'm a Jew, I'm, I'm a believer now, but I understand how, old, how hard it is to, to lay aside your old thinking about the law and embrace grace. Because we all as humans believe that you don't get something for nothing. I mean, you say salvation is based on grace, Paul, but I mean, surely I've got to do a whole bunch of things to maintain salvation. Uh, by way of review, notice what Paul says to law lovers uh, for salvation in chapter 3, verse 20. He says, uh, because by the works of the law, no flesh no flesh, no exceptions, will be justified in his sight. That's pretty simple. No flesh can be justified as a sinner in the sight of God Almighty by performing works. He says, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. What does the law say? It only can tell you what is sin. We don't know what it is, coveting or adultery or whatever. We don't know it's sin until the law tells us so. But the law can't help you get saved. Paul says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's code word for the entire Old Testament, even the righteousness of God, notice the preposition, aren't prepositions important? We, have, we talk about this quite frequently. Through is a preposition. Now, I, I heard when I was on a sabbatical that uh, Alex Zaccarelli, I knew he was preaching for me, heard he did an awesome job, by the way, for his Dallas Seminary uh, preaching sermon. I had to do one of those as a young man. Uh, were you here when Alec preached? Yeah. You're so quiet. Was it, it was good? Yeah. yeah, that's what I heard. I heard it was good. Yeah, I heard, uh, I heard he analyzed one verse, God love him, and he did language analysis, didn't he? Awesome, awesome. Why is the preposition important? Because it tells you how you get saved. All this righteousness comes through faith in Jesus, not works, faith in Jesus. For all those who do what? Believe and work? No, he says, who believe? For there's no distinction for all of sin, Jew and Gentile, and fall short of the glory of God. So even my Jewish sister-in-law, Martha, We've had these discussions before. What does she need? She needs Jesus, the Messiah. I've had these discussions with her. I remember the first time after Liz's twin sister died of cancer when she was 33 and uh, Martha was at my house, she, the window opened to speak to her. And she said, how can you believe in the Messiah? I said, how can you not? I said, have you not considered he, he's all over the Old Testament? Well, how can you believe Jesus is the Messiah? Let me, let me show you. I took her to Isaiah 53 and explained to her that that's the messianic prophecy, the one who comes and dies for all our sin. She said, I've never heard these things before. I said, obviously, but you must know them. This leads to life. She's still considering. This has been since 1993. Don't wait too long. Paul says, if you're a Jew, it's hard to change the law structure of your life. Why? It's ingrained in you that you think you've got to obey things to get saved. Paul says, you don't get saved before God except through faith in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Uh, in chapter 5, verse 1, remember we are reviewing, remember? <laughs> chapter 5, verse 1, he says, therefore, having been justified by what? Faith. faith. Not faith plus works, but faith. What's the natural result, cause, effect, relationship? Peace. We have peace. We have shalom. I think it's irene in, in Greek. With God, and notice the preposition after God? Three. Through. How many realize that is a preposition right now in your life? <laughs> and you totally care about it. Through. Uh, you get this through or by means of who? Lord Jesus Christ, by no other means. Pretty simple. Now, he knew that it was entirely difficult. It's not in the Bible, per se, but, it's, but it is true. It is hard to teach an old dog what? New, New tricks. tricks. You have an old dog? How many have an old dog? You have an old dog? I have an old dog. If I were to take little Riley a schnoodle, he's a schnauzer and a poodle. If I were to try to teach him some new things, he would just yawn and walk away from me. You know, and the older that you get, the harder it is to learn new things, right? So if you were steeped in the law, I got to do all these things to get saved. I got to obey the five pillars of the law, of the of the law, or whatever, whatever it is I've been taught to then have grace save me. It's tough, but it's what needs to happen. Paul says, "I'm going to talk to the Jews in the Roman church and tell them, hey, you need Jesus, all of Jesus, and it's by grace. It's not by the law. Uh, they have been accusing him of not liking the law in chapter six, if you'll remember." Because they're basically, their, their statement is this. Paul, if you are anti-law, then you're anti-nomian. Anti-nomian, anti-law. If you're anti-law, then that means you're for us doing anything we want to as Christians. That's lawlessness. Surely you're not for that, Paul. Paul says, uh, let me talk about that. So that was chapter six. He laid those questions to rest. He still knows that they're thinking about the, the law and grace and having an issue with it. So he's gonna address it again in chapter seven. Why? Because he loves them. He's a great teacher. He wants them to understand uh, the immensity of the situation, how important grace is. 
So he's going uh, he's gonna to come up with an, an analogy. Here's the analogy. An analogy has this motif in this chapter. Chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. It has a really interesting analogy about marriage. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Wedding. A wedding. Here's what he's going to talk about in this chapter. A new marriage leads to what? New life and new living. Does it not? How many are married here today? And you're totally proud that you were married, right? You're excited? Yeah. I've been married uh, 38 years. I mean, I'm I'm a happy man. I mean, I love I love being married. Um, Paul says, "I'm going to talk about marriage for a minute. I want to give you an analogy, man. I just need to talk to you for just a minute. Have you ever, have you ever been talking to your beautiful wife and having a discussion about something kind of complex, and you decided just to give her an analogy, and that would just clear up everything? And she looked at you and said, "That has got nothing to do with what we're talking about. Has that happened to you? <laughs> has it happened to you?" I mean, I'm an analogy guy. I mean, we've had this discussion many times. Paul says, uh, I'm gonna, it's going to be kind of, I'm going to step out on a limb here, but uh, I want to give you an illustration to show you that I'm not against the law. I'm for the law. and not for lawless living. I'm for lawful living. Let me explain why through a marriage analogy to the Jewish people. So what is he, what is he going to show? Well, in the first three verses, he's going to tell you there is a harsh reality. It's a real reality. Death frees a person to remarry. I mean, anybody can get that, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. If you're married as a Jew and you're a lady and your husband dies and he's Jewish, you're free to marry someone else. If you're a Gentile and your husband dies and you're a lady, you're free to marry someone else. That's what he says in verse 1. He says, uh, do you not know, brethren? He's talking to the Jews. Then he parenthetically adds, for I'm speaking to those who know the what? The law. What law? Well, the Torah. He said, I'm speaking to you specifically, but if you're a Gentile, you understand what I'm going to tell you, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. So when you walk down the aisle and say, I do, and we do all the, you know, the ring ceremony and the wedding, you know, the whole thing, and you repeat all those things, I just did a wedding the other day. Uh, When you say all those things, uh, that's for life, right? Before God, before God Almighty. The law has jurisdiction over you as a husband and you as a wife until you die, Right? What's that got to do with anything, Paul? Uh, well, Paul's going to, here's, here's what he's trying to show. If you were first married to the law as a Jew, the Torah, and if you're a Gentile, you're married to moral law. You can't get away from God's law. It's built into the fabric of the cosmos. So if you're married to the law as a means by which to try to please God, uh, and that you can't please God because you can't totally fulfill the law, if there's a death involved of one of the people of that relationship, one of them's free to remarry, Someone else. You follow me? The first row got it. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, how many are totally confused at what I just said? Confess now. Just afraid to raise your hand? Yeah. Uh, you understand? If this marriage was good and that mate died, this, the, 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 you know, the husband died, the wife's free. Well, the point's going to be that that wife is free to marry somebody else. In this analogy, that person's free to marry Jesus as the groom. So keep that in your mind as we're looking at this. He says in verse 2, let me give you the analogy. Here's the analogy. Here's the scenario. For the married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he is living. But if the husband dies, what? She's released uh, from the law concerning her husband. So then, he says, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, though she's joined to another man. What in the world? See, Paul, you know, he's a rabbinical scholar. He's getting into all the tyrannic law here. He's basically, there's a lot behind this that he's uh, not saying. But basically, from what we know of scriptures, uh, you have two clear reasons why uh, a marriage could be dissolved before God. Two that I know of. One is your mate committed, commits adultery. Then you're free. Jesus said so in Matthew 19, verse 9. If there's immorality, sexual sin, you're free to remarry. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says, if you are a Christian married to a non-Christian and the non-Christian doesn't want to stay married to you because you're Christianity and they want to break off the relationship, that's another viable way to get divorced. Other means of divorce uh, are not clearly stated in Scripture. Those are the only two that I know of that make it, make it viable. All right, But that's a whole other discussion for another day. Don't get lost in the detail about adultery. What Paul is merely saying is, if your mate dies, you're free to remarry, right? Uh, and it doesn't mean that the first marriage wasn't a good one. It's just you get another opportunity to enjoy someone else. So if you were married before to the law, you had two options. What were they? 
Torah law or moral law. You were born into law and couldn't please law and could never su sufficiently do all the things to please law to be saved. The next option is to be married to Christ who fulfilled the law. I'll, I'll show you a picture. Here's a picture in case you need a little graphic help. So in this scenario, uh, you as a non-Christian are the bride, right? Jesus is not on the scene yet. Now it's just the law. Remember I told you you have two options for the law. What are they? It's a review time. Torah and moral law, all right? So if I'm a Jew, it's Torah law. If I'm a Gentile, it's moral law. I can't get away from it. So if I'm a non-Christian, I'm born in that relationship, and I, I can never do enough to please moral law or tyrannic law to get saved, and I know it, and I'm just, I wore out. But Paul says that doesn't save you because the law can't save you. You need Christ. You need a new groom. But there has to be a death before you're legally released before God, which is point two of a two-point sermon. He says uh, the reality is death frees a mate. The result is a new mate when you remarry equals a new life, doesn't it? If your wife dies or your husband dies, you're free before God to remarry, and you get to like start over and enjoy life in a whole new way to someone else new potentialities, etc. Verse 4, notice what he says. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law. There's been a death to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, or there's another wedding, he says, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit to God. So he said, the wonderful thing about the Christian life is I'm not anti-law. The law could only tell me what sin is. It couldn't save me. But he said, in Christ, we as Christians died when he died. He bore our sin. When you get baptized, what are you showing? You go under the water, the old you died. When you come up out of the water, the new you spiritually is alive. See, there's been a resurrection. That's what he talks about here. That's why these religions I just mentioned will work overtime at denying the, the death of Christ. Well, he, he wasn't really on the cross. It was somehow they got a body double in there. It wasn't really him. They deny the resurrection, etc., etc. Paul says that's the core of the gospel. Christ came to earth, died for our sins, rose the third day. That death, when you believe in his death, you then died with him. That death then frees you as a mate to marry him. Now, I know if you push his analogy, it all breaks down. All analogies do. But his analogy is death frees you to marry Christ because he died for your sin. Really, who are you married to is the question because you're only married to one or the other. You're either married to the law or you're married to Jesus. One saves, one does not save. Who are you married to? Why are, why are we married to Jesus? What does Paul say here in this passage? We are married for, well, what does he say? So that you might bear, what? Fruit to God. That your marriage might be overflowing with fruit to God. See, now for the first time in your life, now that you know Christ and you're married to him, he comes to dwell with you. The Spirit, he gives you the Holy Spirit. Now for the first time in your life, you can live in such a way that it pleases God. You can live radically different. I mean, your life's totally different. You're not the old you. The old man is gone. The new man has come. Radical life now, because now God it can empower you to live a holy life that pleases the law, pleases him, because he's with you. What does a radical Christian life look like? What time is it? It's 11.57. What is a, that's a whole sermon series. I have job security for the next 10 years. I'm thinking. <laughs> what does a radical Christian life look like? What does a radical Christian look like? Any ideas? Well, that's the fruit. I mean, you're going straight to the Bible. Uh, Matt, uh, Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Oh, yeah, there it is. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. You know, this is the kind of fruit you produce if you know Jesus. So if you look at your life right now and you think, none of that fruit's hanging on my tree. Guess what? What's the summation? You're not married to Jesus. Now, you might think you know God, but you don't, because if you know him, you just start producing this stuff. Well, like, what, what, what kind of love? Well, it's agape love. Well, that's divine love. It's not phileo, brotherly love. It's not eros, erotic love. It's agape love. What's agape love like? Selfless. Selfless. It's not self-centered. Uh, does it drag out skeletons out of the closet every time you have an argument with the wife? No. It forgave her a long time ago of whatever doesn't remember all those past atrocities. It's, it's no, no strings attached. It's agape love. It loves, the, it loves the unlovely. It loves like God loves. And when you love like God loves, it naturally leads to joy because you're living a life that's pleasing to God and you just have joy because you know you're walking with God, which leads to shalom. 
because you have an inner peace because I don't care what's going on in my world. I have peace because I know that I'm walking with God. I mean, you know what I'm saying? And if you have peace, then you don't get upset in traffic because you have patience. You should just be driving going, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah. I spiritual fruit. Yeah. But if you have none of that in your life, who are you married to? The law. But if you start seeing that stuff in your life, it's like, I know Jesus. He's producing all this in my life. See, when you get to know him, he helps you live a radical life. What's a radical life look like? You didn't answer the question yet. Um, radical Christian life makes time for God every day. And he's so important to sit down and talk with him. I mean, you can't wait to sit down and talk with him or just listen to him. A radical life um, seeks to order your life according to his life, not your life, your character. You say, God, is my character reflect Christ? When he's going to point from heaven and go, well, in this scenario, no. You need to fine-tune that. Okay. I mean, radical Christian life begins to change. See, a, a radical Christian life knows how to give to God generously of all the treasures he gave you. And our church has done that in an amazing way for our building program, by the way. I commend you. You understand that radical giving. It's generosity. Um, a, a, a radical Christian life knows how to serve because Christ was a servant. You were a servant. You mimic him. Were you here last night? Wasn't it crazy? I went home just like, oh, whoa, I'm so tired. You didn't come here to rest last night, right? Because we had the Harvest Festival here last night. So I don't know, there's a couple thousand people here. Every year that I serve, uh, we get plugged in somewhere. I've done the, the baseball game for a couple of years because I used to play baseball. But this year, right by that pillar there was a toilet. <laughs> and there was, there was a, a toilet paper rolled with different colors of uh, duct tape. And... Uh, Liz and I ran the, you threw the toilet paper into the toilet bowl game. <laughs> huh? I don't know. It, it was amazing. I think every kid in Burke lined up to play that game. I was there for two hours. I have never thrown so much toilet paper. Over, and Liz kept telling the parents, don't let your children do this at home. <laughs> Six rolls of toilet paper. You know? And these kids were into this thing big time, high-fiving each other. They were like, hey, haven't I seen you a few minutes ago? Yeah. It was like four or five times in a row. It was amazing. And I'm looking at all the people here. I mean, there was, it was packed all over the church, even outside. Why does the Harvest Festival work so well? There's a lot of reasons why. By the way, Tammy has an amazing team, I must say. But it works because of great planning, strategy, etc. But because the church is full of servants. Because Jesus was a servant. That's why this church is awesome. Servants, men and women, young people, servants. Yep. What's amazing is when we were done, how quickly they returned this place back to a church. It was a mess. I mean, I was sweeping with a big dust room. Reminding me when I was a janitor in college, it's like, I have never seen so much stuff on the floor. But look at it now. Isn't it awesome? Why is it like that? Because there were servants that came in here and cleaned and worked. And, but that's radical Christian living, isn't it? See, if you are married to Jesus, that comes natural. If you're married to the law, it's, hey, you got to serve me. No, Jesus says, no, listen to Paul. Radical living understands what it means to follow hard after me, Jesus. Paul says, I remember when I wasn't a Christian in verse 5. He says, while we were in the flesh, you remember back then when you weren't a Christian? Do you remember? I do. What was that like? The sinful passions, which were aroused by the law, were at work in our members of our body to bear fruit to death. We didn't produce fruit to life. It was fruit to death. Why? Because our passions are what we obeyed. I didn't obey God. And Paul says, I remember that. And then he's going to throw in, it's very interesting. He throws in uh, in verse 6, but now things are different. We have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we might in serve in newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. When I didn't know God, he says, I worked and worked and worked to try to be saved. And I was tired because I couldn't save myself. And he said, when I came to know Christ, I put down all those evil passions and embraced Christ by faith. That's the newness of life. That's why you have joy. Which fruit are you producing on your tree? You have two options, fruit to death, fruit to life. When you are a spouse to Christ, you produce life. Eternity hangs in the balance. I close with a story from my vacation in uh, California this last summer because it's, is, it's so theological. Uh, I had a friend. Uh, I had her for many years. She's the largest cherry grower in the world. So very f financially well-to-do family, godly family. And uh, she has different places to go live. And 
And uh, so she offers them to us, uh, you know, has for 30-something years. So she offered us her, her private residence on Lake Tahoe with the private beach, private gate, etc. There's some things you just don't pray about when they come along. So she called us and said, hey, I hear you're in Sacramento with, you, you know, with the grandkids. Do you want to go to my place for the, a week? We said, yeah. So we took the grandkids up there, had a lot of fun. And about a day before we left, I'd been to this house many times. They'd remodeled it. It was very beautiful. So I was going around because I like stuff like that, and I'm looking at the woodwork and everything. And there was a door that was built into the, there was a, the main front door, and then solid core wood. And then there was a screen that came out of the wall. And that had never been there before. I'm like, this is cool. You hit the little button, and eh, I was just playing with that thing back and forth. And, and uh, <laughs> as I was standing there, you ever, ever, ever have something happen where you're like, your body's telling you, like, something bad's happening. You need to kind of wake up. I mean, it kind of felt like something was kind of ominous. So I was sliding the door back and forth, and so I closed it, and I'm looking at this little dot in the middle of the door to keep you from walking through it. And I, I thought it said something, so I'm staring at it, trying to read it. And uh, all of a sudden, I thought, no, something bad is near me. I need to pay attention. I looked on the other side of the screen. There's a 1,000-pound bear. That's what I did. <gasps> on in for dinner. I mean, you got to be kidding me. He's standing right there on the front lawn. So I screamed one word, monosyllabic, as loud as I could. No, bear, bear. I didn't need help. I was about ready to be dinner. I was like, bear. Well, my, I, I hear everybody in the house, my little five-year-old granddaughters, Papa, we want to see that bear. Oh, no, no, no. Here, I'm running down the staircase. I'm like, get back, get back. I mean, well, the bear's just standing there, and all the family's coming out on the porch to look at the bear. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And <laughs> then the bear took off running. You know, you know the scary thing is? He's on the front lawn, really nice turf. Couldn't hear him. Couldn't hear him at all. I was like, that's spooky. I mean, death is right there, and I didn't even hear it. So then he ran around the side of the house, so I ran around to the back porch, and I ran out there, and I'm looking at the lake, and there's a pier that ran out there. There's a whole bunch of college kids jumping into the lake and having fun and laughing. And I go out there to go, hey, <laughs> you know, bear. I no sooner got out to the back. This has something to do with my sermon. I, <laughs> I no sooner got out to the back wooden deck, and they saw the bear. They matured quickly. <laughs> they were jumping off the dock not for fun anymore. It's like self-preservation. I'm like, the bear can swim. <laughs> I mean, it's over. <laughs> and it's like, anyway. So I'm, being, I'm getting to my point. So about that time, it's kind of getting dark, and there's a lady comes by. And remember, this is a California mindset. I know it. I'm from there. Lady comes walking by with her three college daughters. She's walking by uh, very forcefully, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm up on this deck. And so I lean over to her, and I go, excuse me, ma'am. Yeah, what? <laughs> very friendly. And I said, uh, I, you know, I know you don't know me, but there, there's a thousand pound bear right down the end of the house right here. She looks at me and she goes, whatever. <laughs> whatever your dinner. See, see ya. You know, and I said, I, I like to joke around. I am not joking you. It's right down there. Keep walking. You're going to run right into him. She goes, that's ridiculous. Come on, girls. Let's go. Okay, whatever. Well, while she's doing that, the daughters are doing this. I don't want to trip, but the daughters are doing this. They're going, hey, mom, like, suppose he's right, and I don't know if I want to see a bear, blah, blah, blah. So the mom, who's still going forward, finally turns around, and she goes, well, this is just dumb. Okay, I guess I'll go with you. So she walked back with the daughters. I'm like, are you kidding me? I go back in the house, and I'm like, this is a theological situation. <laughs> Isn't it? Yes, thank you. One person. <laughs> How so? Two ways. Number one, death was imminent on the other side of the screen. I didn't even know it. See, that's like a person who thinks the law is going to save them. Death is imminent, and you might not even know it. I'm here to tell you, well, Christ is life to deliver you. Backside of the porch. Some people can get a warning of impending death and laugh and mock in the face of the warning. Kid you not. What does Paul say to the Galatians? I cannot believe that you would so quickly abandon the gospel of Christ for a false gospel that isn't saved. He warns them. What am I doing right now? I'm warning you in a loving way to say, if you are bound by the law and think that's going to save you,
whatever that law is, it will not save you. It's the wrong marriage. Only the marriage to the bride, of the bride to Christ is what saves. And how do you get married? Well, it's called grace and faith in the risen Savior. You married to him yet? Is the greatest thing that can happen to you. Take the warning and ask, what must I do to find life? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for Paul uh, and his, his analogies. Uh, what a great teacher he was. Uh, and thank you for the depth of his argument uh, and for the, just the ability for us to l- read it, understand it, and make applications so that we can learn from it. Thank you for the wonder of the gospel, uh, just the beautiful marriage analogy that you desire to be our groom Uh, and to lead us to a life that's radically full of holiness. And if anyone in our church does not know that understanding, might this be the day they become related to you in faith. In Christ's name, amen.